This is Regin's Travels Podcast. All right, welcome to another episode of Regin's Travels Podcast. Joining us today is Jenica Dizon. She currently serves as the country director for Waves for Water Philippines, a humanitarian aid organization focused on providing clean water access. She graduated with a Bachelor in Fine Arts, majoring in Information Design and double minoring in Management and Development Management from Ateneo de Manila University, while at the same time receiving the Loyola Schools Award for leadership and service as most outstanding individual. In 2016, she was conferred the Gawad ng Kaunlaran Medal by the Armed Forces of the Philippines, the second highest distinction presented to civilians and government officials for her involvement in community building. In 2019, she obtained her Master's in Water and Sanitation for Development as a Marshall Papworth Foundation Scholar in the United Kingdom. Outside work, she is a PADI Certified Rescue Diver and also a Certified Vinyasa Yoga Teacher. Hello, Jenica. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Regin. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me today. I just got back from a project in Palawan, so trying to catch up a bit with work and um, yeah, doing speaking stuff like this to help get the word out about what we do. But for the most part, I've, I've been good. How about you? Yeah, I'm good. Um, I'm stuck here in the Philippines right now because of the pandemic, but overall, it's good. Where are you supposed to be or where would you have been if we were not in a pandemic? Yeah, I'm supposed to go back to China to work because right. I was I was working in Beijing and then I quit my job to travel the world in 2019. And then after that, I'm supposed to go back to China to to have another work, but this time a different company. But because of the pandemic, I'm, I'm stuck here, but it's okay. Um, I'm working online as of the moment, still teaching English. Right. Well, it's nice to hear. I mean, I guess all of us are just making the most out of the current situation. <laughs> yeah. And I saw your photos. You were in Palawan, I think, a few weeks back, and you were doing this community project, Waves for Water. It's, it's an amazing, you know, seeing the pictures. You're helping the community, especially these communities in the mountains. And I've also seen your, your pictures, and you've been to a lot of places, <laughs> not just in the Philippines, but also abroad. Wow, you've traveled a lot. So of all your travels, first of all, like what started you to have this, this, let's say, lots of traveling opportunities or traveling activities? You've been to Spain, Turkey, you know, a lot of countries in Europe. So what started it all? I think really what started it all was, um, yeah, the kind of family I was raised in. So I've been very blessed and fortunate to, to have been raised in a family of, um, I would say, travelers, mga kaladkaren, and, and people who really are just fond of experiencing life, you know, not just within the comfort zone, but really going around and experiencing how things are different in not just in the country, but all over the world. So it was really my upbringing, even my lola, my Lola loved to travel. So it was an opportunity that, you know, I'm very grateful was extended to us. So for the for the most part of my life until my you know, later adulthood, I I could easily remember or I could easily say that my family has been, you know, my travel buddy. Like we've, we've, we've loved to travel as a family and it's really this experience and also the exposure. My mom's a doctor, so she would also take us on medical missions. So I've got, I've, I've had the experience of, I guess, um, you know, the more leisurely travel and also traveling for more purposeful um, intentions, such as doing outreach activities and medical missions. So it was really this upbringing that I think has led us or has led me to, to you know, really wanting to experience the world more and not just, you know, staying in one place. Wow, that's amazing. So at a very young age, you had opportunities of traveling abroad or you started traveling in the Philippines in the beginning? In the uh, both in the Philipp I also have a lot of family in the U.S., so it was quite easy to to visit them, and you know because you have free accommodations. But um, I'm really grateful that my parents also exposed us to you know just just the beauty and the wonders of, of being able to travel around the Philippines. So growing up, I really have fun memories, and I think it's really helped build 
a memory bank of, of um, experiences with um, my family, even my grandparents throughout the country. Yeah, you've been to a lot of countries, especially in Europe. So of all the countries that you've been to, which one is your favorite? Aside from the Philippines, Bayan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, aside from the Philippines. Let's say aside from the Philippines. I would say maybe I have a little bias for um, the time I spent when I was in the UK. It's not really a country. I would say England if I was made to narrow it down to a country because I got to live there. I think, you know, and you can also relate, I believe it's different when you live in a country and not just travel through it because you experience just, just the way of life and how different it is. And also for me, I can say I've lived a fairly sheltered life. So it was there where I really got to, to live independently and really just rely on my own and do everything on my own and be ex able to experience um, just, just a different culture, interacting with different people. So I really enjoyed my stay there in England when I was doing my master's. So I think I would say I, I'd have bias for, for the UK. <laughs> yeah, it's really different if you live in a country compared to just traveling there for a few days. and. I've, I've been living abroad ever since 2009, and I've realized that the more you stay in a country for a long time, the more you appreciate the country and the more, the more you understand, like I was living in Thailand before living in China. So I really appreciated those countries just because I was able to experience it more, like even going to the countryside, not just in the city and being able to have relationship with the locals, yeah. make friends with them. So I think these are the things that make it special as well, not just the place or not just the destinations, but the relationship that we have with the locals. So you've mentioned you're a little biased. So I think the bias was there because probably you've developed a relationship with the locals or even fellow travelers when you were in England. That's really interesting. Yeah. I think it's really a lot about the people you experience um, these destinations with as well. So while the sites are really nice, I think what, what really creates an additional layer of meaningful experience is the interactions, the meaningful interactions you have with people and the locals that live there. So definitely, I would definitely agree with what you just said. Did you like the food in England? I like fish and chips. I mean, I wouldn't say England is known for its food, <laughs> but uh, fish and chips was nice. <laughs> right, and full English breakfast. <laughs> yes. Yes, um, we have our restrictions, so we're not really able to eat everything. But um, yeah, no, I, I really had a, a wonderful time there. Yeah, usually when I ask people about countries that they like, they mention because of the food and all that stuff. But then those people who love England or the United Kingdom and ask him about the food, it's like, what is the food in the, in the UK? It's like, it's, it's nothing special. It's kind of like every other food in the world, the basic Western food. And I even saw your, your travels in the Philippines. You've traveled quite a lot here as well, even to remote places like in Mindanao, in Batanes. So what were you doing? Why were you able to go to different places in the Philippines, even prior to working for Waves for Water? Um, well, I've always forged, well, I've always forged a a career in the development sector. So um, my first job was in environmental policy. So I was working with a um, cabinet secretary in the previous with the previous administration on um, just um, improvements on the current mining law, mining act. So we we had it entailed a lot of travel in in quite remote areas to assess the situation, to assess you know just just how mining and its effects were in the communities and so i was doing this and then i was also volunteering a lot i used to be with um save philippine sea so it's it's a um conservation nonprofit in the philippines that you know focuses on really just saving our marine resources so i had the opportunity to visit um, the turtle islands through a friend who was affiliated with save the philippine seas to do um to help with the biodiversity inventory, do some research about the, the unique flora or more fauna, um, unique species on the island. So I guess um, traveling this way, really not just for the leisure aspect of it, but in a more intentional and meaningful part, because I'm either contributing academically or policy wise, has really helped um, me really just really opened my eyes to how things are different in, in not just in the city in more remote areas but also what needs to be done and what we can do as as individuals 
Right, and that's what I noticed as well. You have lots of activities about vo about volunteers being a volunteer, or you have lots of advocacy for the environment, like you've mentioned, uh, taking care of the sea and and even mining in with regards to mining. So when I look at your, your resume, you you majored in fine arts when you were in college and minored in, I think that was management, business management or something like that. Yes. Right. But then now you're focusing on these community projects of helping other people and and having this advocacy, like especially for the environment. So what made you what made you pursue this kind of, let's say, career, if you will, and especially in our society in the, in the Philippines, we are expected to to have a stable job or let's say have a high paying job or put up a business like that's the expectation of society in general but you decided to pursue this advocacy and a lot of volunteer work especially for a non-profit organization or kind of tied up with the environment so what made you do this thing despite uh being able to graduate at a very good school like Ateneo de Manila I think it was really my upbringing um, and my exposure. You know, I think growing up, we never really know that the experience we have as children have, have quite the huge impact on us, you know, as, as we grow older and also influence the kind of choices that we make, especially in terms of our career or what we're going to pursue. So growing up, as I mentioned, I really had the opportunity to be able to travel the country with my family, you know, on holidays and vacation. And um, we also scuba dive as a family. So I started scuba diving when I was nine. And so I really saw, you know, just, just how beautiful the Philippines was. I, I really love the Philippines. It's amazing. It's, it's beautiful, the kind of rich resources we have both on land and under the water. It's just amazing. And I've, I've, I'm so, you know, honored to have been able to experience and see that for myself growing up as a kid. And so having this kind of um, exposure, you know, you, you begin to love the environment you love. And because you, it's something that I, I highly value, I love you, you it, it turns into wanting to protect it. But you only want to protect what you love and what you have had a personal experience with. And that's why travel is so important. And also teaching conservation and advocacy and caring for the environment, because it's really personal experience that drives people to do things. And so it was really this personal experience of mine that led me to pursue the kind of career I have. Um, while it may have seemed, it may seem, um, a huge jump from my degree because I had the fine arts degree in Ateneo in information design, but I really think that I'm able to fill in the gap because people also need science communicators, you know, in design and also in what you do and, and, and providing a platform for people to be able to share things um, that they're passionate about. I use communication as a way, you know, good design as a way to communicate to people the different issues that we have, but not just the issues, but solutions that people can participate in. So I think ultimately really the, the issue of, of the pro a lot of the issues and the problems we have boils down into how we communicate it to different audiences too and making people understand. Because the there's, there's always this, um, there's kind of this dissonance between say scientists, those who know stuff and us laymen. So for, for, for me to be able to be a bridge between those, I think is, is my role as a communicator. And that's why I feel like my degree as a fine arts, you know, a graphic design or information design major really helped. And then my minors also helped because now I run the nonprofit that I used to volunteer with. So it really just, I guess, you know, branched out. And in a way, while things may have seemed all over the place when I was you know, pursuing stuff, looking back, diba, things always make sense backwards. So you think, wala naman talagang nasayang. All the experiences I accumulated really helped prepare me for the next step or the next career that I was going to pursue. Right. And I think as long as you're happy with what you're doing and you you're, you find meaning to what you're doing, I think whatever your major was when you were in college, it, and even if you're not pursuing it per se, it doesn't really matter as long as what you're doing now, you find it very meaningful because I know a lot of people out there, even myself, I am a nursing graduate, but I'm not practicing nursing anymore. And maybe some people would think, oh, wow, you kind of just wasted your degree or your major, but I'm, I'm, I love what I do and I'm happy with what I'm doing compared to if I really pursued what I majored in college, I, I don't think I would be happy if I, 
I would have pursued that one right now. So why would I still continue on doing that and sacrifice my happiness and, and meaningfulness just for the sake of just because that was your major in college so don't waste it just for the sake of not wasting it you have to pursue it so and it's really good that you've mentioned that even though you're not really into doing that formally but at least you're still using the skill that you have acquired yes. like especially with nowadays, it's a lot of online work yes. <laughs> because of the pandemic and you're a fine arts major and, and in communication. But then when did this start? When when was the turning point when you decided, okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be focusing on on volunteer work instead of just going into into fine arts, for example? Was it after graduation or even before when you were still think, studying? Yeah, no, it was really ever since. Um, it was really something I was passionate about. Um, I did start working in government, so I was a policy officer, as I mentioned. So I did try that route, and you know, I felt like I could affect things at the at the policy level. But you know, government can also be frustrating work, and as a staffer, as, as somebody who worked, you know, not as a, as a cabinet secretary, there's just only so much that I could do, and this is why I stayed only with them. That job for a year and then I moved to Palawan. So I moved to Palawan and lived there for a year. I was a environmental officer of a, a group of resorts in El Nido. So I worked a lot with the community there, with the community surrounding the island property. I worked a lot training with the staff um, and also helping with the sustainability measures of the um, company. So I did try some corporate work, but then um, I realized that, you know, I really just love working in the field. I think it's, it's where I'm happiest. And really, you know, you get to travel kasi so meaningfully. So I think it was really that led me to, to this job. It wasn't easy. I think my parents were also shocked by the kind of work that I chose to pursue because people would think walang pera. But um, I wouldn't say I'm a full-time volunteer. I do get paid. So I, I'm very grateful to be paid for, for the work that I do um, in the nonprofit. And I think it's also something I'd like to shed light in that, you know, when people donate to nonprofits, there are people who run them full-time. And that's why a part of your donations not necessarily go towards, you know, all the projects because people who run the organization need to be sustainable too. They need to be sustained and paid living wages. There's rent to pay. There's bills to pay in the office. So I think um, people misconstrue nonprofit work as volunteer work when it's not. It's full-time paid work. And I'm glad that Waves for Water is able to support, you know, its staff and pay living wages and also me. So I'm, I'm very grateful to be able to do what I love and get paid for it. So I think we're, we're, we're one of the lucky ones that, you know, it's 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 a luxury to be able to to be happy in the kind of job that you do. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. And I remember one of my colleagues before when I was in in Beijing, we were teaching English, and and that was a high paying job. But then before, prior to that, prior to going to Beijing, she was working in Africa as a Peace Corps volunteer. But then she get paid as well, even though not as not as much as in Beijing, but she still gets paid. And then after working in Beijing for a year, uh, getting paid good money, after that, she just told us that she's not going to renew. She's going to go back to Africa to work for the, the Peace Corps again. And just because she, I think she finds more meaning in doing those kinds of activities in Africa, in the villages in, in Africa. So, yeah, it's good that you get paid. But at, at the end of the day, it's... I think it's just not about the money. It's the meaning that you find in doing these kinds of activities, especially you've mentioned that you go out there in the front line, just working in the offices. I've seen your pictures with Jasper, for example, going to the mountains. You were hiking, you were carrying those, <laughs> those jugs of water as well. So you're really in the front line. And it's really amazing that that there are people out there despite of the things that you've accomplished or the things that you can even do career-wise or money-wise decide to have these kinds of activities and and be and even be hands-on on these kinds of activities no it's it's very rewarding work and i would say yeah like what we've been discussing it's it's very um it's a luxury to be able to do the kind of work that we do and find happiness in it because not a lot of people would be able to claim that as their priority. But if their priorities are supporting their family, then unfortunately, they'd have to take on jobs that might not necessarily give them happiness. But they can find happiness elsewhere. You can, you know, 
pursue hobbies, you can volunteer on weekends. So there's just a lot of ways to find meaning in what we do. But I think it's also important to say that meaning is really not just found in the jobs that we do, because there's so much more to life than, than the work that we do as well. And I'm glad that you've mentioned priority as well. And you've mentioned that some people would want to have this kinds of, of activity as well, or this kind of job, but at the same time, they have, you know, they have more responsibilities in terms of financial, like a family to support. But then if you find meaning in even doing that, like working for money, but at the same time, you find joy in supporting your family, for example, you don't have to go to the mountains to, to, exactly. say, to say to the world that oh, I'm, I'm living a meaningful life because I'm going to the mountains and I'm doing volunteer work. It's, it's, not, it's just about volunteer work. And, and you've mentioned that you're blessed to have a family that we're able to provide and you don't need to really, you know, support probably your siblings in going to college, for example, and they're able to do this. So, so that's really good. And wow, at a very young age, you were scuba diving, nine years old, that's amazing. And you're going to medical missions when you were a kid. So is, is your mom kind of like tied up to, to, to a hospital or a company or she was doing private work, just doing volunteer work? Yeah, she's a missions? pediatrician. So um, she does it just um, participate in a lot of medical missions. But yeah, growing up, I'm really grateful to her for also um, giving up practice to raise her children, raise us. So she gave way to my dad's career and um, did practice as a full-time doctor so she could raise us because one of them wanted to stay at home, obviously, and raise, um, raise the children. So for the most part, it was my dad working and my mom was a, yeah, full-time mommy. <laughs> Wow, that's, that's really amazing, you know? Like, I know a lot of, not a lot, but I know some families who decide to have that route where just one parent is working and the mom is mom just stays at home to be a full-time mom. And and based on my observation, the, the, those families, the kids are, are really turned out to be amazing children, to be honest, just based on my observation. And I know a lot of examples, especially, you know, I, I, I studied in, in, in Adventist campuses, AUP and MVC, and I've seen these families in, in these schools. And, and I was like, wow, I, th I think there's really a benefit in doing that because you can really see the evidence uh, that because of that move, the children turned out to be really good kids growing up and to be, and even when they became adult, they were able to really contribute to the community and live meaningful lives. So I think I think your family's another example for that. <laughs> it's Thank good you to know. Thank you very much. No, no, my mom. Uh, we're really grateful for, I guess, you know, the sacrifice, the leeway that she's given. So, um, you know, to prioritize the family first and then, yeah, set aside her, her practice as a doctor. Right. And, and, and I think it doesn't have to be forever. Like, the crucial age of a kid is from zero to six, I believe. Like when the kids are growing up from zero to six, it's important that the mom is at home. But then when you turn seven, I think it's okay for the mom to work. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have to be like until you're a teenager. Definitely, definitely. Wow. And now you're the country director for Waves for Water Philippines. First of all, for those who are not familiar, even myself, can you please tell us a brief about Waves for Water and how did you end up being the country director? Um, yes, yeah, so Waves for Water is a humanitarian aid organization that works on the front lines. So with grassroots communities providing clean water access to them through a variety of solutions. So that's either through filtration systems, um, constructing rain catchment, so maximizing um, the rainwater resource that we have augment storage supply and capacity in communities who have um, experienced water scarcity. We also do well restoration. And um, so aside from those, we also do disaster response initiatives. So we were founded in 2009 by John Rose. He was a pro surfer who was already at the twilight of his career looking for next step when he happened to be surfing in Indonesia when the 2009 earthquake struck. So he had a couple of filters with him and I would say primarily for personal use. And then he saw how you know it could be used in the context of disaster response because during tsunamis, earthquakes, you know, water pipes are broken, people don't have 
clean water and then also clean water for cleaning wounds and such. So he saw how, you know, the filters could be used in that scale. And so since then, um, we've operated and done projects in over 48 countries and have implemented over 155,000 clean water systems. It was also um, a disaster. So unfortunately, it was, um, unfortunately, fortunately, it was Super Typhoon Haiyan or Yolanda that led to, um, Waves for Water establishing its office in the country when the headquarters responded in 2013. And I started um, volunteering for Waves for Water in 2015. So um, the then country director, um, we had a common friend, so we were introduced to each other. And as Waves for Water Philippines was starting, you know, registering all, all the bureaucracy that comes with um, running a, an organized and registered nonprofit in the Philippines while all that was going on, um, I just started offering my help. You know, I was familiar with government. I was familiar with a lot of procedures of, of in the bureaucracy because you know that's that's that was my first job. So I think, and 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 that's why I say to you, na sayang in terms of me, you know, hopping from one job to another. The network and the connections I was able to make really helped um, the organization to where it is now. So I started volunteering, and as my involvement grew and grew, I became their um, operations director in. I would say 2017 and then um yeah i took on i just took a study leave and i was doing my masters and then i returned 2020 um magpa pandemic na, and then took on as um yeah the role of country director last august 2020 so yeah i think you know when you think about it and i guess when i recall it this way it's, it's quite amazing and i'm really grateful to have had the chance to to work in an organization like waves for water because i just started as a volunteer you know never in my imagination would i have thought that you know i'd, I'd become its country director a couple of years um, after but that's where it's led me now and i'm very grateful to be able to do um this kind of job Wow, so that was in 2019, 2009 when it was founded. And yes. yeah, and I think during that time, like you've mentioned, he was in the twilight of his career. And I think not just his career, but his life was kind of like a mess before before starting this. Am I correct? Correct me if I'm wrong. It's like he was a surfer, but then his life is 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 not doing well in terms of his relationship with his wife, you know, something like that. Yes, there is a Red Bull documentary of of Wade Surwater and um, our founder, so that bit is discussed a bit. I guess you know, surfing because it has this, it has quite a relatively short um, career. I would say any yeah. any sport would say that's that's quite intensive. You can't really stay that much long. There's always somebody new and up and coming. So I think, yeah, he was really just at the crossroads of what he was going to do next in, in his life after that, you know, that peak moment. And it was really that trip in Indonesia that kind of really set the tone for and the, the direction for what he was going to do next. Mm, wow, that's really amazing. <clears throat> and it's like a life changing experience for him as well, not just benefiting other people, you know, starting these kinds of movement or organization benefits you as well, not just other people. In 2009 earthquake, I quite I don't quite remember the one, but then, wow! And you've mentioned that you use filtration system, and at first it was just using it for personal use, but now you're you're providing this to communities basically. So, yes. yeah, so it's it's really amazing, you know. I've I've been watching the demos that you were doing or that they were doing as well to different countries. And it's like. Even though how dirty the water is, just by doing that, it becomes drinking, it becomes potable water. It's really amazing because I always thought that for that kind of dirty water, that level of, of dirtiness, if you will, you need distillation for that. It's not just like a simple filtration system, but for that, that's really a, an amazing technology that you, you know, it, it was really brown, brown water then just by filtration you can drink it. That's really amazing. Amazing technology. Yes, definitely. And it's also simple and it's also um, readily available. So it's really why, you know, we, we've been using it for quite a long period of time now in terms of providing clean water access because often water really isn't the issue. It's the quality of water that's available. So making water that's readily available, also potable, is really what we do as an organization. So access to clean water. And what do you think is the is the benefit? Of course, 
obviously like you have water to drink but then you've mentioned there's a ripple effect to to an access to drinking water so what are the other benefits if a community can have access to clean water so access to clean water is really a game changer because you know once you have your health secured because in the philippines for example diarrhea for for a lot of young children is still a leading cause of death and we think about it nobody should really be dying of diarrhea anymore it's easily solvable it's easily preventable it's such a waste of human life for you to die of a waterborne disease just because of the water that you're drinking but unfortunately it still happens so once you have your health secured kids are, all, are able to stay in school more. So they're not having to skip classes because they're sick, women and men. So adults are able to pursue other productive um, work, other productive opportunities for them because they're not also home being sick. Kids are also, women and children are also often, I would say women and girls are disproportionately affected because they don't have, um, say, gender sensitive toilets accessible to them or menstrual hygiene management. So I'm going into the larger scale of things now, but water sanitation and hygiene really all go hand in hand, but having something so basic as your health will really able to open up a host of many more opportunities just because you're not sick. So basically what you do is you go to these communities and you distribute these buckets or filtration system Yes, basically, but a little bit more. We do more than distribution. We train. So we work with community leaders. Our goal really is to empower the communities that we work with. So we don't um, just, you know, um, create a culture of dependency. So we want to be able to help capacitate them. So capacity building and also transfer technology so that they're able to maximize the solutions that's available to make better their situation. So we don't just give it to them and that's it. We train them, we co-implement the projects with them, we co-identify the problem. So they have to acknowledge that there is a problem and that this is the cause of their problem. Dirty water, it's causing them sickness. So them being able to identify that as an issue will also get them on board in the solution that we are proposing. So once they're on board, it's really, you know, working with them that really ensures the projects become successful because our goal really at the end of the day and i would say i would like to generalize for a lot of nonprofits is is to be dispensable to not be needed because when you're not needed anymore as a nonprofit then that means that the services you provide are already met in the communities that you work in so we don't want to create a culture of dependency we want to empower people and that's why we take this help the helpers approach so we empower community leaders to be able to take charge of the solutions that are at their disposal. But for the things that you distribute, do you, do you just mainly give them those, let's say those buckets and filtration system, but for the source of water, it's the same, they just get the water from the source originally, but they just have now a filtration system kind of thing. Yeah. Or, or do you have like a huge tank, for example, providing a water system or just the filtration system? So we also um, construct rainwater catchment um, or harvesting um, systems. So these are larger tanks that will help augment the storage capacity of a community, especially if they're in remote areas that don't have um, piped in water supply or their supply you know, takes a few kilometers to, to get to. Mm -hmm. So we do set up catchment tanks. These are more location dependent. They also need a larger roofing surface area for the water to be funneled into the tank. So there's there's some considerations that needs to be done, but really for the most part, as you said, we work with the existing water sources available and then make them potable. So you've been working with Waves for Water since 2015, right? Yes, yes, 2015. Correct. So as of the moment, what are some of your, let's say, favorite moments working for that organization? There's really a lot. The work is very, very memorable. Um, you're able to travel um, to so many more places meaningfully. You're also able to get to places that aren't, you know, really part of somebody's tourism map, but then you realize that they're so beautiful, but also that there's so much need. I would say there are a few trips that have particularly struck me. One of them was um, a trip to Batanes for a disaster response mission where I think a lot of my or a huge part of my perspective changed because, um, as I mentioned, I, I was really into a lot of marine conservation work at first. As I said, I, I scuba dove, I started scuba diving as a young kid. And then um, so while we were waiting to get transferred to another island in Batanes, I started speaking to the fishermen in shore to ask what they um, were catching 
the kind of fish did they um, catch at that, that hour. And then they showed me, um, yung hule, they showed me the kind of fish that they caught. And I saw Dory, you know, a surgeon fish from Finding Nemo. So, you know, that really bright blue um, and black fish. I was really surprised. And I, you know, immediately my parang conservation hat kind of activated and I said oh how much are you selling the fish for because um, you know Finding Nemo the characters of Finding Nemo the clownfish surgeon fish etc people wanted to have Finding Nemo characters in their homes but on contrary to what the movie wanted to say mm-hmm. the fish wanted to go back to the sea people wanted to have these characters in saltwater aquariums in the homes in their homes and the Philippines was a contributor to that library fish trade and so automatically um, I assume that the fishermen were also doing that, selling the fish for aquarium and causing, you know, significant population decline. And so I asked them how much were they trading the fish for? And then Kuya says and tells me, Ay, hindi namin yan ibebenta. You know, we're not going to sell that. We're going to eat it. Kakainin namin yan kasi may paparating pang bagyo. So I was really embarrassed by by my, you know, my myopic view and and just just really that the privileged perspective that I still had and sometimes was not really aware of because in a way at that point in time, I could have honestly said that I cared more a lot about the fish than the people. So it was really a moment of reckoning for me and also for people who do conservation work and who, who advocate for a lot of things. You know, when you say you want to save the environment, the environment doesn't need saving. You know, it's, it's, better and well off without the human so anything you do for the environment really is about people anything you know when you say you want to save the sharks save the whales save the trees it's it's about people it's about people whose lives may significantly be affected or us who significantly defect affected by its decline because we're all part of one ecosystem that's connected so really my frame of mind and my perspective changed at that moment and i realized that you know this is really why we do the work that we do at waves for water we provide clean water access basic needs first and then begin to educate you know you can't be always anti-everything anti-mining, anti-logging, anti-everything, when it's really these jobs that put food on the table. You can't advocate for things long-term and say, stop doing this, stop doing that, think about climate change, think about sustainability, when these are all long-term concepts, when people are just trying to figure out where they're going to get their next meal. So having access to basic needs is really crucial in making people understand why everything else is important in the long term. But it was really a moment of reckoning for me and I'm really grateful for that interaction. So I would say that would have been the most memorable um, and impactful moment in one of the trips I've done with Waves for Water. Wow, that's, that's really deep, you know? I wanna, I wanna take some time to, to think about that because that, that's really awesome. That's really fascinating what you experience there. And I think these are the moments in travel that are really valuable, not just the sites that we see or the experiences, but but this interaction with the locals and the knowledge that you gain. Especially, wow. Yeah, I didn't I didn't really expect the answer of the local as well when you were when you were and the but they're just they're just there for livelihood. And often we, we vilify people who we think are doing wrong things, but they're just trying to live and support their families. Yeah, wow. That's that's really uh, a different perspective. And it reminded me as well of when the whale shark in Oslo was still starting. Yes, that was uh, a huge issue. That was a huge issue. And I was there when it was still starting. In I went there in 2000, and I think that was in 2014, early 2014. And when then when I got there, it was still not crowded as compared to now. Now it's a different scenario, but before it wasn't yet crowded, but foreign tourists are already going, but not yet crowded as it is now. And even during the time, they're receiving a lot of criticism online from people. And most of them are Westerners, you know, these are Western you know, people who are having advocacy for the seas and all that stuff. And they're receiving this uh, criticism. But when I was there, I was able to talk to the locals as well. And I was able to see their livelihood of what they're doing. And during the time, it, it dawned on me that these Westerners are so uh, aggressive in, in telling the world or the people to stop doing this because they're hurting the the fish and the environment but at the same time if you look at these people this is their source of livelihood because before 
before this before this industry they were they were fishermen and it's not always uh, a very sustainable livelihood in that part of the world sometimes you don't get you don't catch fish you don't you don't have something to eat or even the time when when tourists were not there they will end up catching even the whale shark itself for them to sell to to other nationalities who kind of are interested in that in that animal but because of this they find more value in those whale sharks and they take care more of those whale sharks because of this industry and and it taught me as well that okay these westerners don't have a clue they only think of of the environment in total but then these people they care for what to put food during that particular day so it also gave me a perspective and it reminded me of that when you've mentioned your story in batanis that was really amazing Yes, no, I totally agree. Well, obviously, you know, we might not fully agree with how they're doing it in terms of how sustainable the fish feeding practices are of the whale sharks. But so certain balance really must be struck. But, you know, you can't just demonize and it's not purely black and white. It has to be gradual. You have to provide an alternative. But if you're going to take that livelihood away, what alternative livelihood are you going to provide that's less destructive, that's non-extractive? So all these things need to be taken into consideration when when you know people just go against something and not think about how it really affects people so i think that was really you know how how my horizons have expanded and my perspectives were changed in, in the work that we do at waves for water yeah it is one thing that i've learned as well like what you mentioned is not always black and white because sometimes we see this we have this belief we have this advocacy and you just okay let's stop this but then because of these travel experiences then we realize it's not black and white wow it's just really amazing and how were you able to to connect with the jungle school in palawan yes were you able so, to collaborate with jasper yes yeah, so i knew jasper from church um I've, I've met him a couple of times we were supposed to meet up in europe when i was also living in the uk but the schedules didn't align so he he was stuck in the philippines and i knew he was he was not very happy about that so um and i knew he was a good storyteller and he was a good filmmaker and so when the opportunity arose for me to do a project in palawan not at brooks point first this was in quezon i i invited him to come with us at waves for water and help document for the project so that was really that was back in june when um yeah when we both traveled to palawan and did the project and he's pretty much stayed there since then so um he knows what we do as an organization he he identified the clean water needs of the community and i was very much happy to be able to come back there with the help of our private partners um to fund and implement our projects in and not just the jungle school but in um for 13 others so i thought we did a total of 14 communities and we reached um yeah, 14 communities across um, Brooks Point and the neighboring um, barangays within the area, those who were residing in the mountain villages. So it's it's come full circle for me in terms of me returning to Palawan, but Jasper has to stay there for quite a long period <laughs> of time. Were you able to go to El Nido during the, the, this pandemic? I was able to go this back, back in June. I was able to go to El Nido. Oh, wow, June. So it was, it was already the the pandemic, right? June yes, 2020. Yes. So, so how was it? Yeah, no, just, just like a couple months ago. Just June oh, this year. This year. Yeah. Wow. So you're able to experience El Nido without the tourists. That's amazing. Yes. yes. Um, and I guess that's that. It comes to the job. You know, you you enter as an abor, so you're an authorized person outside of residence because there is work to do. But you know, waves for water. The mantra of the organization is do what you love and help along the way. Um, we were we want to plug in purpose into things that people are already passionate about. So whether that's travel, experiencing new cultures, interacting with different um, people, why not just add in, you know, something more purposeful and provide clean water access if there's a need? Because often it's really in this beautiful but also remote areas where, where the need is, the, is great. So yes, I, I'm happy to say, and I'm not ashamed to say that I also enjoy and, and um, I'm happy to, to enjoy and have a bit of um, leisure and rest time during the trips that we do in, in really beautiful places in the country. Yeah, I saw I saw his pictures that he posted of in Lidia without a tourist, and I was so jealous. I was like, "Wow, this is so pristine." It reminded me of the movie The Beach. You know, it's like hidden paradise, especially with those cars, mountains, amazing, amazing. And I was like, uh, "I wish I was able to experience 
that as well. Yeah, it comes that was one of the benefits of doing these kinds of activities. Certainly. So how about you? How do you plan? Like, how long do you plan in doing these kinds of activities? Or do you do you do you do you plan to go back to let's say the corporate world or have your own business, pursue your major, or do you see yourself doing this long term? No, I see myself doing this long term. I mean, I did pursue a master's in water and sanitation. I see water as really the rising global challenge. You know, it's second, it's the next oil in terms of what people are going to unfortunately come to war for, because it's such a resource that's that's really scarce right now. You know, there's there's extreme weather events. We 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 describe climate change in terms of water, either an abundance of it or a scarcity of it. But in terms of the water that's available and properly managed, because water has to be always accessible and available, and that's not always the chance, and that's always the the case. And um, you have you know lands lands that are bordered by tributaries, and they fight over water. So it's it's very much happening now. Water is is. Just, just going to get bigger and bigger. We've experienced this in Manila. I'm not sure if you experienced it there, but even if you have pipe and water supply, there's still shortage when it's not managed properly and you don't prepare for severe droughts. So I do see myself in water and, and working in this whole sector for for quite, a, quite, quite an extended period of time. I think until there is a need, I, I'd be very much happy to, to continue the work that we do. Wow, but they, they also received some comments about why you're not pursuing your major, you, you just wasted your major. Do you also receive these comments once in a while? I would say not really because I have been able to use my major. I do a lot of talks, um, you know, I, I speak to a lot of kids, schools, corporates, I do a lot of webinars and that needs a lot of good communication, good design to be <laughs> able to present the problem properly and be able to communicate it, you know, tailor fit the communication to a certain audience. You're not going to present the same thing to, you know, scientists, what you're going to say to, you know, the IP groups. But this has really helped in the way I know how to communicate and design, you know, posters and materials that are fun for kids, understandable for adults who may not have had formal education. So I see development communication really as a huge, plays a huge role in being able to communicate the problems that we have, the solutions that are available. So I haven't really heard it from, from people that, you know, I should go back because, the normal route that I would have taken if I pursued, you know, a career in my major would be mm -hmm. advertising, advertising oh. or um, marketing ad agency, which which really isn't um, something I'd like to pursue. So I, I think I'm, I'm very much happy to stay where I'm at now. So since you're a fine arts major, did you visit as well famous museums in Europe? I did. I did get the chance to visit um, the Louvre in France. Saw the Mona Lisa. <laughs> Wow. So yeah, yeah, definitely. I've, I've had the chance to. Great. And you've mentioned you're really into water. So are you also par particular with, you know, drinking water, like bottled water? Because I know some people, I uh, forgot the term though, about like they're so particular with the, the, the taste and the quality of water that they can differentiate different kinds of bottled water from where it came from, the yeah, source. Yeah, the source. No, I don't really involve <laughs> myself in that. I think it's quite lofty too. I'm glad they have the time to. But, you know, while people are struggling to find water that they can drink, that's <laughs> it is important though. I mean, social norms, making water acceptable does play a role in making sure that people drink it because, for example, if you use chlorinate to treat water, some remote communities don't really like the taste or the smell of chlorine. So you'll have to use other treatment methods. So to a certain degree, taste and smell really play a role, but I wouldn't think of myself as, as a connoisseur and then drink yeah, overpriced I water. <laughs> I forgot the term. Let me, let me search. What was the term for the... Ah, I forgot. Anyway. Yeah, because there's this man. It's like, because usually people would, would be into wine and kind of like differentiate the taste, the subtle taste, the distinct, you know, the details of wine or even coffee. But then this man is like, for water, he can differentiate something like that. And my friend is also in, into that kind of activity or, or he's, he really likes to try different bottled water. And I was, I was 
influenced by him as well trying those kinds of water and i was like whoa this water tastes really good and i remember there's this bottled water from italy from from the alps from the italian alps that i bought before when i was in beijing once in a while i will buy and i was like i really love the taste you can really taste it's different from normal bottled water and <laughs> because of that i want to go to Europe one day, like kind of like visit the, the sources like Evian, for example, in France or even Fiji, you know, that kind of thing. So I thought you're also into that because you're into water. <laughs> <laughs> just plastic, right? Additional packaging that is going to be a waste and will just go to waste. So I'll try, well, I try to keep it simple. <laughs> and you're into yoga as well. What, what, what kind of yoga was that again? V Vinyasa, yes. Vinyasa yes. yoga. Can you tell me more about yoga. that yoga and why? Why? What made you interested in yoga? Yeah. So you know, wellness. I think obviously, aside from drinking water, I think wellness is really has has really taken the center stage in in our lives. You know, having having not just good physical health but also mental health and and overall well being is important. And um, when I was working in Palawan in El Nido. Um, it was also a dark time in my life because, yeah, I, I, I thought it was a dream job and I realized it wasn't. So I felt like I climbed a ladder that was that lean, was leaning against the wrong wall. And when, when I got it, parang, it wasn't really as satisfying, as, as fulfilling as, as I thought it would be. And so I, I went into a down spiral of an existential crisis <laughs> and um, really wondered why, why and why, why I was doing things that I was doing. I, I really didn't know. I couldn't see a future ahead. And I, I, ha I went into depression. So it was a really dark season in my life. Um, it lasted for... For over half a year, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but it was just also when I was diagnosed with um, bipolar and I realized that in a way, it's also what's helped me be overproductive and, and just have a high sense of um, activity and achievement and productivity for the things that I did. But when I would spiral down, it would really be, be my downfall. And so I realized that I also had to find a happy middle. And when I, where I was working, they had an in-house yoga instructor and, you know, I got into it. I just, it really helps because you ground in the present, you know, a lot of time. So anxiety, you know, when we're anxious, it's, it's really a severe attachment to something that we think will happen in the future. Depression naman, diba, is a severe attachment to what has happened in the past that we haven't really been able to process or get get over. So exactly. anxiety and depression are, are severe attachments to things that have happened and things that are yet to happen. But yoga really just helps you stay present in the mm. moment through the postures and the movement that you, wow. you make. So the mind, body, and breath connection really helps people ground down, calm down, be able to be more introspective and meditate. So that's really helped me, I guess, find find a happy middle in my life and in the way I live. And so that's something that I'd like to share to people as well. So, you know, you know when it's something that you believe in, you can't help but share about it. So I finished my yeah 200-hour yoga instructor course last, I think last July. Or last August, just just last August, I finished it last August, and I, I, I've been teaching since then. Wow, but I'm wondering though, I'm, I'm becoming curious about this because I've interviewed some people here on the podcast as well, and there's a similar trend. Like they are pursuing their so-called dream job or living the life, but it's because of that particular moment where they suffered depression. Even Jasper told me that he was traveling. Yeah. A yeah, lot, yeah. and because of that, he suffered depression. And there's one guest as well here where he was doing, you know, he was location independent, and he, she thought that was that was her dream job and that will make her happy. But then she suffered depression as well. And here you are telling me that you were in El Nido, a very beautiful place. You were you were employed in a let's say I can imagine a nice resort and, and doing what you love. But then it was that moment where you suffered depression. What do you think is the cause of that? I think when we put our identity in things that we do, anything external to us, when we put our, so we may do meaningful jobs, but that's not the only thing that defines us. You know, you can find meaning in a lot of things, but when you also put your meaning in finite objects and finite, um, and finite things like your career, relationships, um, education, and your achievements, they're really bound to fail you in some way because, you know, 
as 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 humans we're we're not meant to be fulfilled by the finite diba and i think that's really what i've learned had to learn the hard way you might find temporary temporary happiness or fulfillment in certain things but ultimately it 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 won't satisfy and that's really why um you know i'm really glad to have been grounded and raised in the faith so i'm christian we're christian and i think it's really important to to know somebody know somebody higher know god who is even more infinite and can fully satisfy because no job no fulfilling job will really will really cut it out in the end kasi you'll always be burnt out you're always doing you're always trying to achieve something when when you think about it we're called we're called human beings not human doing our calling really is just to be and when we find ourselves really you know get in touch with with us ourselves and and the infinite and not just fix or find our identity in the things that we do or in relationships we pursue i think that's where we'll be most happy so i've also learned that i'm not really supposed to do everything you know i like what i do i like providing people with access to clean water but i'm just a small piece of the puzzle and i'm not really meant to be doing everything and burning myself out wow <laughs> a lot of deep conversation here a lot of a lot of things that we can quote from you <laughs> we can tweet that one <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and you've mentioned achievement because a lot has been said of tying our tying our purpose to material things to wealth to money that will lead to to <laughs> unfulfillment or 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 depression or to being not happy but then a little has been said that it's not just about money or or wealth or material things but also achievement you know like people are saying oh because you're pursuing money you're not going to be happy or you're, you're pursuing you're building an empire or something but then it's not just about money but also achievement like some people you have to achieve this this and this and thinking that we will be happy because of that but then at the end of the day you achieve that one then you you would want to achieve more so i think it's not just about material things it's also the culture of having to achieve having to oh, you should also always be productive you know especially in the west like you should always be busy always be efficient and productive that if you kind of just relax and have slow living it's kind of like people feel guilty <laughs> and you're not supposed to be you're not supposed to be burning yourself out because if we were diva we would have been called human doings if if we needed to be always doing something but we're just supposed to be and be enjoy and enjoy in in our being as human beings so i think that's that's such a huge perspective change for me when when i you know came came into terms with that and so i feel like i'm less uptight of a person i'm i'm less of a Yeah, I I don't drive myself crazy anymore trying to do everything because I know I'm not meant to. Yeah. It reminded me of the movie Eat Pray Love when this American, you know, the culture of in the West and the US is you always have to to be productive and to do things to achieve, but then she went to Italy and then these Italians were just hanging out and then they told her that in the US you don't know how to how to relax here in Italy we have a saying i forgot a term in, in it saying something like dolce vita like the the joy of doing nothing something like that and i really like your post on instagram about the sabbath that sometimes because of this desire of doing more achieving more that we we tend to really overdo things and forget about rest but you've mentioned that you're just happy that you believe in the sabbath in shabbat that where you just forget about the cares of the world and just and just realize that it's just not all about you doing things but you have to relax and things would go on and kind of like you know the tagalog word paubaya to god everything and i really like especially the picture that you post the sunset that's really beautiful that was taken by jasper <laughs> i thought so <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, definitely. It's, it's um I think as you go, you know, as you learn things, you you realize that things you thought were important weren't really as important and ultimately our identity really is is should be found in in the infinite and should be in something so much bigger than us. And you've mentioned you're a Christian yogini? Yes, yes, because I wow. think some people um think that 
Christian and yoga can't can't work together. That, that's what I thought when I saw that one, and I was like, when you you've mentioned. You've mentioned that through meditation you're communicating to God. I was like, wow! Finally, someone said it because growing up, you know, growing up, I've always thought of meditation as prayer to God. You know, especially with the writings of Ellen White, yeah, she's she's saying that, or even in the Bible, David saying that, I meditate with your law day and night, something like that. So, I always thought of meditation as prayer, communicating to God. But then nowadays we're surrounded by these, you know, yogis and a lot of things about Zen Buddhism, Hinduism, all that stuff from India. And meditation is kind of tied up to just being present and all that stuff. But then when I saw your post, finally someone said it, that meditation is not just about being present or or doing this, this you know, with the background of Buddhism, but it can also be a way of communicating with God. Yes, yes, definitely. And I think it's it's a misconception that the two and two can't go together. Obviously, yoga has, has its, you know, Eastern philosophy roots, and that should also be respected. But yoga isn't a religion, you know, it's just a means of how you can understand and do life better. So if it works for you, if it helps you be more present in, in, in the way you live, and, and it helps you calm down, it helps you take a break, then you know, there's, there shouldn't be nothing wrong in it, especially if you meditate and um, fill yourself with with God's word. You know, you really have a choice of what you put your thoughts into and what you fill your mind with. So it doesn't have to be Eastern philosophy. It doesn't have to be Buddhism. It can be what you believe in. So if you're a Christian, you know, you meditate in God and God's word. And I think being able to focus and ground yourself in the present will really also help you tune out things that will distract you from really being able to fully meditate in, in God and His Word. Wow. Very nice, very nice conversation with you, Jenica. I really appreciate your presence here on the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Reg, and thanks so much for having me. And any final words to our listeners out there who are probably because of the pandemic or tying their desires to achievements and material things are also suffering from depression? So I think I think life has its seasons. Um, I think social media always makes it more complicated also for a lot of people because we always see people's highlights and not necessarily the hardships that they experience behind the scenes. So really just... Um, know and try to identify what season you're in and really just just go and grow through it because things will pass so if it's a bad season right now it will pass and it's really important to to really anchor yourself in something bigger than you and i found that in god and being christian and i hope you also you know people also get the chance to experience god as, as somebody real and somebody who cares for us because he does and if you're looking for things to get involved with you know please get in touch with me and waves for water philippines we're always on the lookout for people who'd like to do projects with us and yeah if anybody has questions or if anybody would like to try yoga please follow me on um, instagram at jenica Deason or mermaid yukini that's where i post um, all my yoga teaching schedules thank you very much regin for having me and have a good day to everybody listening thank you thank you thank you and before we go i'm going to leave you with this quote be the change you wish to see in the world from mahatma gandhi thank you guys for tuning in this has been your host regin till the next episode mm-hmm.